Hello and welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead, go ahead and get started. Um, welcome uh, to this latest in a series of knowledge sharing events for the Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative. My name is John Conley, Senior Program Officer with the Safety and Justice Team at LISC. Uh, our team is one of the two training and technical assistance providers for the Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative, along with our friends uh, at the National Policing Institute. Uh, and again, RVCRI is funded um, by our friends at the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the United States uh, Department of Justice. Really excited to bring you uh, this topic today, Introduction to Rural Community and Economic Development. Um, as LISC being one of the country's oldest and largest community development intermediaries, we wanted to make sure to have an opportunity to talk about how we approach this work as an organization through a, a, a rural lens and why community and economic development partnerships, projects, uh, and opportunities are so vitally important to local law enforcement uh, and your mission to reduce crime, improve the quality of life, uh, and serve uh, those in, in your jurisdiction. Um, with that, I've got a really great agenda that I'm going to discuss with you in just a moment, but few just uh, uh, but just a few housekeeping items first. Next slide, please. So just a quick acknowledgement disclaimer that although this project is funded by our friends at the, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, that the opinions, findings, and conclusions and recommend, uh, recommendations expressed are those uh, of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Justice. Next slide, please. So just a few event logistics. You'll notice the event is being recorded and we'll get this posted uh, on the RVCRI resource uh, webpage and the List Safety and Justice webpage as soon as we can um, so that you can share that with project team members uh, that weren't able to attend um, today's, uh, today's event. There will be a very brief uh, event survey that I'll put in the chat uh, when we get to the question and answer session uh, and really do encourage folks um, to, to fill that out as it helps guide um, future topics uh, and content and helps improve the delivery uh, of that content and future events um, for the program. And then finally, we are hoping to, to hold the last five to 10 minutes of, of today's event um, for questions and answers. So please do encourage um, for uh, attendees to utilize the chat or question and answer session or uh, feature. Um, we do intend the session to be as much of a discussion uh, as possible. Next slide, please. So today's agenda, first you're gonna hear uh, from my colleague uh, at, at Rural LISC um, to hear about an introduction on how that team approaches uh, community and economic de development work uh, in a rural lens. Uh, after that uh, conversation, um, you'll hear a reflection from the field from our friends in the, the borough of Tamaqua, uh, which is located in Pennsylvania. And then after that um, uh, presentation um, from the field, we'll again have opportunities um, for a question uh, and answer session. Next slide, please. So here is the opportunity for me to introduce my rural list colleague, um, Julianne Dunn, um, who will be our first presenter. Uh, Julianne joined the rural list team as a workforce program officer in, in April of 2022. She manages the Rural Works Workforce Development Program, provides technical assistance support to three RVCRI sites in collaboration with the Safety and Justice Team, and co-leads the Rural Financial Opportunities uh, Centers Program. Previously, she worked as an instructor for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture, Community, Professional, and Economic Development, primarily managing a rural economic development project focused on retail and tourism, and has worked in community and economic development for the past 15 years, with the past six in rural economies. Uh, I would note Julianne also has an impressive academic background, uh, but for the sake of brevity, I will close my introduction with just a personal note that it's been a real pleasure uh, working together with her this past year in support of the RVCRI field and really appreciate her contributions uh, to the project. With that said, happy to turn uh, the presentation over to you, Julianne. Thanks, John. Um, it's always a little weird to hear you know, people talk about you, uh, even if you happen to write that bio. Um, but I'm really happy to be here and talk about um, this great intersection between community economic development and uh, law enforcement and justice um, and how we can work together. Um, and I'm going to start with just talking um, about uh, what we do. Um, and of course, just a reiteration of the agenda, but I just really love this picture too. Um, so we like to start with, there's some a variety of definitions 
of what rural is, which is wild to me, but we um, base it on the USDA definition of 50,000 people or less. Um, the majority of the people that we work with are less than 50,000. Um, at this point, 50,000 feels like a big city to me. Um, and we also like to consider how far away it is from a metro hub um, or how how much activity is going on in the community um, focused on community and economic development um, and what resources are available. Um, and the biggest component here we like to talk about is, um, well, I'll, I'll talk about, this is where we are working. Um, you'll see, um, I'll talk a little bit about where, what we do, how the many different programs we do, um, but um, that's the different colored dots. You can also see this on our website. Um, if you want to click on some of those dots to learn, um, if you're surprised your neighboring community um, is working on things, you could follow through, but we have 150 local partners across 49 of our states, um, including Puerto Rico in that conversation. We also used to be in Virgin Islands as a territory, but um, that program recently shut down. So we are, we are uh, not working there right now, but we, Keeping this map in mind, um, you know, we do talk about 20% of our of the US lives in rural. Um, that's an extraordinary amount of people considering we only get about six to 8% of federal funding, philanthropy, and resources that are focused on rural, even though we have such a tremendous population that is spread across the country and uh, a number of them, um, as you all no, are not near the resources that provide the quality of life that we all consider as important. Um, so what we often do as a um, intermediary is we take a lot of, we include, we um, create scalability and take a number of small of, of our partners in rural towns um, in one program and, per, and aggregate the data so that lar larger scale, the federal government, the large funders, can see what it means to impact in a community. Of course, I'm also very biased. I think you can see a lot of impact in a rural community that you that gets lost in the noise of an urban community. Um, so that's, <laughs> I just like set myself up here, but we're not, when we're talking about rural, we have the ability to just make small changes that have huge impact in a community. Um, we taught on an economic development side, um, if we can get people to make $10 more, um, uh, sorry, $5 more an hour, that can have a massive ripple effect in a community. If we get five more people employed, if we have, um, if we keep, um, if we have five people that we can help get out of debt or reduce their debt and increase their credit scores, you know, that has a ripple effect in a, in a rural community that is much more, uh, much deeper than when you see it in an urban community. So I, I obviously, I mean, I'm very biased. I think what we're working in rural is, um, um, is very rewarding. Although you all know it's also very exhausting. Um, so how rural works does this, we, we focus on five uh, pillars as we call it. I am um, that beautiful pillar with the hard hat, workforce and small business, it's pretty much just me. Um, we also uh, have broadband infrastructure. We focus on digital skilling. Um, we also work on broadband access um, initiatives and um, uh, those two efforts um, to help rural be more connected. Um, and the way we've done that is we have a digital navigator program. We have 100 people. And since 2020, we have had 150 people trained in 20 states um, to increase their digital navigating skills, their ability to use the internet, um, like our lot of like uh, Microsoft platforms, like, um, and been able from those 150, they have also individually also been trained to others. Um, and then we have leveraged about $28 million for rural broadband projects. Um, and we also support a lot of innovative broadband. Um, so exploring the different ways to set it up to overcome some of the natural um, ge geographic obstacles, whether that's we're in talking about Appalachia Mountains or um, the Ozark Mountains or the long deserts, like whatever um, Mother Nature is doing to keep us from being connected. Um, Creative Capital, we are a CDFI, LISC overall is a community development financial institution. So we do provide lending opportunities and we also host Kiva. 
um, in uh, since 1995, which is when rural LISC was uh, separated out from LISC. Um, we've invested more than 2.75 billion in grants, loans, lines of credit, repayable interest and in equity in local development projects. Um, and we have long-term relationships with some of our partners, um, as you'll hear. Um, we also do a lot of work in housing, affordable housing in rural is probably one of our most, uh, our largest disasters um, going on. It's very hard to convince contractors to build in rural. It's really hard to get a supply out there. Um, and But not, since 1995, we've been involved in the development of over 52,000 affordable care, affordable housing units. Um, and like what we consider affordable, not what some of our developers consider as affordable. Um, and we also have been working with a lot of our communities in the face of disaster. And um, as John mentioned, my previous job, I was working with retail and tourism when the pandemic started, um, which are two of the industries that were hit incredibly hard during the lockdown. Um, and then in this role, we've also worked with communities to re um, to uh, re-energize after natural disasters through the pandemic, which is considered a disaster through um, any number of things that can hit a community. Uh, disconnection from the internet can be considered a disaster. Um, and of course, workforce and small, small business, we think about workforce as looking at the whole person. So it's not just helping people get into credential and certificate non-degree programs to get them into jobs. So we also work with apprenticeships. We also work on financial capacity to make sure uh, that people are not being hindered from getting a livable wage job because of their finances, um, being helping them get into rental assistance programs, childcare, having access to transportation, as well as some of the justice impacted folks who are who have criminal records that are fee based um, that keep them from being fully engaged in certain jobs in education and healthcare. Um, so that's what we uh, and in since 2020. We have helped over 6,000 individuals with workforce development services. So the whole person in, um, in that way. Um, so in partnership with us, here are some examples of things that we have been able to do. Um, we have worked with a lot of our local communities um, on every single level of leadership in the community to increase their capacity and knowledge, getting them access to subject matter experts, specifically for the issues that they're being changed. We get we love getting people into houses or into more stable rental communities. Uh, we work with um, small business programs to help educate um, small businesses, whether they are new entrepreneurs or they are longstanding small business owners who are not um, not trained or able to be flexible in the new markets. Um, we have um, demonstrably improved people's net incomes and net, net worth to be able to create futures and build generational wealth. Um, and we have been able to uh, infuse funding into certain communities that are not eligible for other programming. Um, and we're just and helping people get the skills, the baseline skills with digital navigating um, getting, you know, we don't do a particularly good job in schools teaching people how to use their computers, um, or if they are not a, a non-traditional student, um, getting them on the right path so that they can get into non-degree programs or getting into apprenticeship programs so that they can, um, they can get into livable wage jobs and impact not that just themselves, but usually their families. So, um, we also have a very, uh, um, baseline, um, everything we are doing is looking to help those work with those who are traditionally, they have been uh, left out for a variety of reasons. We try to make sure things are equitable. So it's not necessarily everyone gets the same thing, but it's what is appropriate for what the needs are for the person or the community. Um, we are looking at, you know, by, by definition, working in rural, we are working with communities that have been left out of conversations within their region or their state um, and help amplify their voice to become a local leader um, and someone that is turned to in larger conversations. Uh, we are fostering um, uh, projects and um, opportunities and partnerships that are trying to adjust uh, to address the uh, racial, gender, um, disability gaps that we have that and obstacles that we have in a lot of our communities, especially in rural, um, and address the systems that have been put in place 
to uh, hurt and oppress, whether or not people intend to be doing that. It's it's uh, a lot of the, the systems that we've created around financial institutions, workplace environments are not designed to support and grow people. So that is a baseline. Almost all of our projects have some level of this um, commitment. Um, and um, a lot of our justice work, as John said, <laughs> uh, we do have separate projects, but we also incorporate how to serve justice impacted communities, whether it's the person themselves that have been in or in jails or prisons or the families that are left in home um, or the communities at large. Um, and this is kind of how, if you want like a visual of how this works, um, if the pillars are nice, but sometimes it's nice to see this as a graphic of our, our holistic view of the community. We are looking at the whole person and all the things that keep them from fully engaging in a community. And we're also looking at the whole community. Um, so when we're talking about educational programs, we're not just talking about schools, we're talking about law enforcement, we're talking about housing, we're talking about transportation, we're talking about childcare and elder care because all of those factors go into the ability of someone being fully engaged in their community. Um, and we have seen over and over again, a little bit of commitment to someone, and I'm sure everyone that's on this call also believes this, a little bit of commitment to someone has huge um, long-term impacts and being able to provide new perspectives to a project in the community or new to leadership, because in rural, we always have that uh, same 10 people, the S <laughs> uh, STP, same 10 people are always, in leadership and what a great way um, to infuse some new blood into who and what is being done, um, just for provide, providing some um, additional resources to the communities that have been untapped. Um, and um, how we do this specifically, because you all wanna know a little bit more about justice. Uh, here's some of the ways that our all five of our pillars work to uh, to increase safety and security and, and address some of the justice issues within um, rural communities. And that is, you know, working in collaboration with our housing folks and our community development and our community, making communities uh, attractive to businesses to be, um, so when we're recruiting businesses to a community, we can help and provide that kind of um, assistance and also help address some of the safety and security issues that large scale employers are um, concerned about. Um, we have uh, we have partnered and worked with to help people improve their skill sets. So you have a larger labor pool, um, which you know employed people tend to be less inclined, um, uh, less um, in in, uh, in some of the more uh, difficult habits and challenges in the community. We have worked with a number of almost all of our projects to address a popu po most populations that who have been left behind and untapped, um, whether it's second chances communities or um, re-entry uh, re programs, or even um, Opportunity Youth, which is one of our biggest investments, working with youth from 16 to 24 who are disengaged from school and disengaged from um, the communities they live in. Um, and we've been providing uh, safe and affordable homes, which um, for a number of our team, uh, most I think is the, um, baseline of creating a safe community is that people feel safe in their homes, um, both physically safe, um, but also like it's safe from crime and um, any kind of uh, um, criminal activity in their community. So we've had, um, I can go into different kinds of projects in this area for these things, but um, I, um, we've also worked on um, helping communities change the narrative that has been told about their communities, um, specifically around placemaking and tourism, which tends to have not only like thinking through the reality of their communities, most people, some communities have such terrible stories they tell about themselves, um, whether that's the crime rate or there might be um, an opioid, the opioid crisis that people love to talk about. Um, and um, Sometimes a community has told that story for so long they don't realize the data has changed about their community um, because the story is more uh, has more sticking ground than a um, actual data and figures. And so we've been we've worked in place making communities come projects as well to help change the narrative of a community um, that is focused on telling the story differently externally, but usually has a tremendous impact on the way people think about their communities as well, those who live in the community, how they talk about themselves. 
um, as well as some of our lending products are, we are able to work in communities um, where a traditional, a bank or a traditional lender would not work because of risk factors that they find uh, challenging, where we know from our experience and our, our, our own data collection that this, these are, these are communities that we can bank on, that we know will work out in the long run. We have more faith than a lot of other traditional financial um, lending services. So that's, that's us in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> it's a big old nutshell, but um, I, um, I'm happy to take questions in the chat and then at the end, but I will pass it on to John to pass it on to Michael and Mike, Micah. Thanks so much, Julianne. Really appreciate that overall um, review of, of rural risk and how you approach this work um, relative to community and economic development. Um, and so how does this partnership uh, actually play out uh, in the field? And for that, um, that we're going to hear from our friends at uh, Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. A brief introduction um, to set the stage as Julie um, uh, or Julianne had um, mentioned earlier, uh, our friends in Tamaqua have been longtime partners of both the rural LISC team as well as the safety and justice team at LISC. Um, so really looking forward to, to hearing about um, the, their experiences and their insights. So very briefly, uh, Micah Gursky uh, has served as the executive director of the Tamaqua Area Community Partnership for over 25 years, uh, currently serves as an administrator with the St. Luke's University uh, Health, no Health Network and previously served uh, 16 years on the Tamaqua Borough Council. Uh, and he's joined um, by Chief Hobbs, who is a longtime uh, dedicated member of the Borough of Tamaqua Police Department and has led the department as its chief uh, since 2020. With that, Micah, I'm happy to turn the presentation uh, over to you and the chief. Thank you, John, and, and thank you, Julianne, for your presentation. And, and I guess I just want to start by saying I, I really appreciate everything that lists, and not, not just for our community, but for other communities. And and when I, I'm hoping that the chief and I can just give you an example of what it looks like in one community. Um, I think the, the relationship that list has with, with all their communities is different, so it's going to look different in every community. Uh, but we've been really happy with our our uh, our relationship with list for many many years, and, and hopefully. Just like we've learned from other communities, we hope that maybe you can learn something from what we've done over the last uh, ten or so years. Uh, but I, you know, I want to thank our chief for, for his involvement and uh, for participating today. Um, so we're going to just start with uh, we, the chief and I did a presentation uh, back in May in our community, just just highlighting the work that we've done over the last ten years to reduce the risk of crime in in Tamaqua, which is a small seven thousand person community in northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, it's an Appalachian uh, coal region community. And so, uh, you know, when you talk about crime rates and crime risk, uh, you know, a lot of times smaller communities don't really have a lot of good data. Uh, so so we're, the data that we've been tracking for the last 10 years as we've been working with LISC on, on, on implementing some of their strategies for diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice and safety, um, you know, we've been tracking this, this data over the last 10 years. And and we've seen a, a significant reduction in our crime risk from doing it. Uh, I'm, I know I'm giving the, the, the ending of the story first, but I, you know, hopefully that'll get your attention. We've reduced our crime risk by 42%. Um, this is a Crimecast, um, which, is a, which, which is a for-profit company that will give you a crimes report uh, on your, the crime risk of any place in the country. It's a geographically based program. Um, and and the, they use, they use uh, FBI crime report data uh, to actually give you a crime risk. And just to highlight the numbers that are circled here uh, on your screen's left, you see back in 2013, our crime risk score was 140. Uh, so the national average for crime risk is 100. They always use the baseline of 100 as the national average. So if you're above the national average, you have a higher risk of crime. So you can see we're at 140. Um, uh, and then in 2022, uh, so about this time last year, we ran the report again, and we've, we've tracked it through, the, through those 10 years. And we're now at an 81, uh, which, which is significantly lower than the national rate of, of 100. And so uh, this, is, this isn't all crime. This is violent crime, homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny. Uh, so crimes against people and crimes against property. Um, and so we partner with our, and, and our community really, we weren't even looking at this data, but we started partnering with our hospital and health system. Uh, and they use this data quite often when they're, when they're citing location. Um, so hopefully this is something that, that you, 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 if you weren't aware of it, you are now. 
and you, you could have access to, to track that data. So the question is going to be, how do we do that? Um, these are the types of, of, of data that are, that's in these reports, US data, Pennsylvania data, and then your county data, and then you can get any geographic location there as well. Um, we use the, the, the model that, that LISC has put out with their justice and safety uh, initiative, basically defining a corridor in our community where, where there's been disinvestment, where there's been um, inequitable uh, distribution of resources, uh, where there's high crime um, and, and, and senses of uh, safety issues. So nothing fancy, just put on a map where, where, is, where is that area? And then we've been tracking the data in that area um, specifically. Um, this is just old fashioned legwork, the chief running through the files and on, a, on an annual basis, you know, tallying up how many re uh, reports of crime and incidents of crime we've had in that corridor. So the first data that I showed you is for a, uh, for a for, for the for the entire uh, our entire community. This is specifically for that crime uh, uh, crime rate in that corridor. I see somebody has their hand up. I don't know if, if we want to we know we'll put the question in the chat uh, if we can, and we will have time for questions afterwards too, John. So uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. I'm going to encourage folks. Yeah, just a reminder of the the chat and Q and A. Best way to get um, comments and questions in, and we'll do our best to to save some time at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Micah. Yep. Thanks. So, so this is specific crime data that the, that the chief just pulled. So there's no, no, no high technology. This is just hand counting, hand tallying the incidents. And we've seen a significant reduction. So how do we do that? The first thing we did was through our connections with LIST, we went to see what other communities are doing uh, to address crime and safety and equity issues in their community. So we went up to uh, LISC in Rhode Island in Providence. We went to the Onlyville community and the Woonsocket community and saw how, what they were doing in terms of uh, implementing a strategy to address uh, high crime areas. We also went to um, Kingston, New York uh, in Ulster County and then looked at some of the things that they're doing as well. So really trying to learn from other communities because uh, typically we're not dealing with any issues that other communities aren't dealing with already. So this safety initiative uh, was focused on a specific corridor in our community, uh, similar to any geographic based program like Main Street program where you define a specific corridor and then you work really, really hard in that area. Uh, so what does that work look like? Uh, one, one thing that LIST tipped us off on was what's called the SARA model, where, where you scan the area and you identify issues and you do an analysis of what are some of the, what causes those issues. And then you develop a strategy and a response and you kind of check your work, how you're doing, evaluate what you're doing. Um, and then you start all over again with planning again. So the SARA model, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, uh, but this is a problem oriented policing uh, philosophy and, and technique that, that we learned from LIST uh, when we used in our safety initiative. Uh, corridor for, for many years. Um, and some of those things that we identified are some, you know, blighted properties. This is a picture of a notorious drug bar that was in our town called the Tiki Bar. Uh, and our nonprofit was actually able to acquire it and renovate it uh, on the left-hand side. And now it's, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recording studio and a, and a teaching studio for piano lessons, guitar lessons, drum lessons. Uh, that's, and it's connected to our art center, which is also in the safety initiative. So taking properties and investing in them, changing their purpose um, as part of that Sarah model. This is a, a really good example of that. Um, also, um, a, a, another technique that we use, it's a strategy called Green Dot, which is engaging the, the entire community. A lot of times crime focuses on the victim of the crime or the survivor of the crime or the perpetrator of the crime. Uh, the Green Dot philosophy is to, uh, is to focus on bystanders, which is everybody else. And so uh, we try to identify what are green dots in your community, things that promote safety, that promote social cohesion, promote a sense of place and community, and then what are red dots. And you try to increase the number of green dots and reduce the number of red dots. And you engage not just, not just law enforcement and victims and perpetrators of crime, but you engage the entire community. Uh, the philosophy of green dot, and I encourage you to look it up. It's a, it's a well-documented evidence-based program. Uh, the philosophy is no one has to do everything, but everyone has to do something. And so we're not trying to not trying to be superheroes, just everyone's trying to do a little bit. And so we uh, so we've we've used the green dot philosophy. Another one that we've used is the placemaking program, that uh, creative placemaking program that LISC has, which is really really related to the National Endowment for the Arts uh, concept of we making, which is using the arts to build a, a sense of community, a sense of connection, a sense of purpose, um, and, and create create opportunities for people to engage in the community. Uh, we've, we've used, we, we've learned from other communities, list communities and non-list communities uh, on doing this. I'm not going to get into we making or creative place making, but I want to put this in your mind as something that is a strategy that has worked 
because we focus this creative place making and we making in our safety initiative corridor and in that specific area. And we've really been able to reduce the risk of crime in that area. So what does that look like? Um, so it looks like public community art projects. Uh, one is called Dear Tamaqua, another one's called Raw Aspirations. We would do, we do about one a year, a community art project once a year to engage the people, get them in the community uh, and use the arts as a way for them to express. And I think as Julianne mentioned, uh, a new narrative. How are we talking about ourselves? What do we think about ourselves? What, what, is the, what does the rest of the world think about us? And how do we use the arts to both elicit that from our community, but also to put it out there to people? Uh, so you see the greetings from Tamaqua mural that is now up in, in our safety initiative um, as part of the tourism and community development program that, that Julianne talked about. So uh, the Dear Tamaqua project, just real quick, was a pretty simple concept. We just asked people to write a letter uh, so the prompt was Dear Tamaqua, and then you can write whatever you want. Um, and we asked them to do that. We got 700 responses out of a community of 7,000 people. And so some of them were letters. And then we also have public opportunities for, for kids and, and anybody in the community to come and paint uh, something that they like, they don't like, some aspirations that they might have, some memories that they have. So this was a Dear Tamaqua painting event at a festival. And uh, we, we also, we, we printed the prompt on, on bar coasters because we wanted to get non-traditional voices, voices that might not be heard. And so we put Dear Tamaqua, that was the prompt and, and an empty bar coaster. And so this is the type of response that we got in those 700 responses. You know, I would like all the drugs gone uh, to help our community. We need more people to care and respect our community. Tamaqua sucks. The people need to change then the town will. Uh, so part of this is just kind of cathartic, like dealing with the good, the bad and the ugly of your community and using the art to do it. So then what we do is we took these letters, and I think I just skipped over one. Uh, we, uh, here's another one. Uh, when I grow up, we went to our schools. This is one that was generated in the school. When I grow up, I want to be a teacher because the teacher I have helps me with my problems so I can help other children. Um, so it was good stuff, bad stuff, ugly stuff, pretty stuff. And then what we did is we took all of those Dear Tamaqua letters and, and inputs, and we created a festival around it. So we were celebrating what we like, what we don't like, celebrate dealing with the dark parts of our community, uh, dealing with the, 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 the positive parts of our community. And we put on a, a little community festival where we were literally feeding back this information and, and, and the words that people submitted back to them. So we had actors reading Dear Tamaqua letters. Uh, and it was really a way to deal with some of the things that we, you know, the feelings both positive and negative that we have about our own community. And so uh, if you said, burn it down, we had somebody say, all right, we're gonna paint a sign that says burn it down and put an exclamation point. Um, you know, just acknowledging that there are some negative thoughts about our community and how we're going to deal with those, and 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 what 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 is our response to those types of uh, those types of thoughts? Because we all have them. We all have love hate relationships with our community. Um, and we did. We actually had Penn State come in and, and do a study, and they actually showed that uh, that, that that doing this public artwork, Dear Tamaqua in particular, actually changed attitudes in the community, changed hearts and minds. Um, it 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 developed social more social cohesion. Uh, there are people at Penn State University and other universities around the country that, that study this stuff, social capital um, and, and things like that. Uh, we're not experts in that, but we, we, we tagged in our partners at Penn State and they did a study to see if their tomorrow actually made a difference. And it, it, it actually did, which is really cool. Um, so then we followed it up a, a year later with a project called Tamaqua Has Heart, which is talking about some of the, uh, the, the positive parts of the community. We had these fiberglass hearts uh, this one in particular, you could see that the chief putting his handprint on there was a collaborative uh, community project where literally everybody in the community was invited to put their handprint on this on this heart. And the heart is still in our in our downtown today. But really engaging the community and in, in, in everybody in the community in, in these art projects and doing it in our downtown. So this was the Tamaqua Raw Aspirations. Uh, when we did the Dear Tamaqua project, one thing that we noticed that was people, people had a really hard time articulating what they wanted for the future of the community. So we brought some artists in and had them do public art installations and we did a festival around it uh, that, that talked about what are your aspirations for Tamaqua? What do you want in the future? Um, and, and using the art, using the arts to engage people in, in that conversation. Uh, that was really, it's really hard to have, it's really hard to have on its own with, without using the arts. Uh, and then we did a very targeted focused project engaging some of our middle schoolers in a, in, a, in a vacant building in one of our neighborhoods and they, they built their own escape room and uh, our art art center uh, worked with them to, to build build an, actually two escape rooms in this in this vacant house as a way to connect our, our young people not only with their neighborhood 
because connection to neighborhood is a really big protective factor, if you're familiar with those concepts. And also having a, a, a relationship with a positive adult is also a protective factor. So we use positive adults and we use our kids and we did it in the neighborhood, uh, the escape room project. And it was a lot of fun. That's the best part about these projects. Are, you know, these, are, these are fun things to work on. Um, then we also did a Choose Happiness mural, again, using school students. They are school students in, the, in, our, in our local public high school. So they developed a mural and hidden inside the mural are 333 images of things that, that their classmates identified as things that make them happy. Again, changing the conversation of, and, and giving people an opportunity to have a conversation about the community in a positive light. So it's now an I spy. You can go pick out the list of 333 things and see if you can find them all. Uh, and it's right next to our it's right next to our historic train station and visitor center. So it's really right in the center of our community. And we 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 actually painted it collaboratively. We had we had people uh, at a festival come and paint by numbers. So young kids, uh, senior citizens, uh, helping to actually paint the mural, and then we they applied it to the they applied it to the to the wall. I mentioned the the greetings from Tamaka mural, which was another creative place making project uh, with in partnership with List where each of the letters has an image in it that, that, that reflects what Tamaquans think of themselves. So the first one is one of our identities is our food and our, and our drink. I mean, we're very proud and it's something that connects us. The other, the second is our music and our art. The third is our historic resources and our heritage. The fourth is our, our wellness and our well-being. Uh, the, the, the Q is the economic vitality and trying to encourage economic vitality, something that brings us together. The U is recreation and sports. Uh, something that really is a unifying uh, factor in our community. And the last one is learning, uh, particularly intergenerational learning. So the mural, uh, it certainly greets people from, to Tamaqua, but it also reflects what, what Tamaqua uh, believes about itself and, and reflects that back to, to our own people. So um, we, do, we do some things that some of your communities might do, like National Night Out on the first Tuesday in August, where we just invite people to come out and, and, and have a, a community event. Uh, we, do, we started a, a coffee shop in our safety initiative corridor where we specifically hire people in recovery from addiction um, and provide a public space that's, that's safe and sober and promotes recovery and normalizes recovery. Uh, we also use the communities that care model, which is really investing not in physical infrastructure, but in our people infrastructure. Um, so we have a program called Raiders Promise and we use the different elements. We the social development strategy for adults that are dealing with that work with kids on, in our community on a regular basis make sure they're maximizing that relationship. Uh, we also use life skills training, which is a middle school program. It, it, it's a curriculum in the school that helps uh, uh, young teens uh, with decision-making and, and other skills that they need. And then we do an after-school program called Strengthening Families, where we work with families and their children to uh, set, help them set expectations and communicate with each other and make family decisions. And they have a lot of fun doing it. So that's the Communities That Care model. And I have to tip my hat to our, our police chief and, and his, his department. And I'm actually gonna turn it over to him to take this slide because they've been a big part of this and we really couldn't do it without them. So chief, you wanna talk through your, your part? Absolutely, absolutely. But talking about couldn't do without, I mean, Micah, definitely couldn't do without you, you know, all the stuff and all the time you put into this all the time. We can't thank you enough. So roles of the police department, uh, obviously always active community engagement. So uh, these are a lot of great programs that we jumped on board with. We, we didn't invent them, but like they work and we use them all the time, uh, like coffee with a cop. Uh, we basically spend about two hours in a local shop just getting to talk with citizens. Uh, I think the first time we did it was actually in our Hope and Coffee downtown in our safety initiative area. Uh, recently, I think we just did it a couple of weeks ago. We did it at the Turkey Hill here, but it's a great opportunity for people in the public to stop and give their opinions and be able to speak with an officer uh, next is National Night Out. And again, it's a yearly thing that we try to do, uh, you know, as much as we can be out there in the public. Uh, one time we gave out like mini flashlights, but we don't just give us them out. You have to have some communication with the police officer. So we actually you know, hand them with them and while we're talking and engage with them a little bit more. Uh, last few National Nights Out have been a little smaller. Uh, I think one time we just had a little walk through of our police station here along with a little ice cream social that turned out pretty well. Uh, moved around to a couple of different locations around town. Uh, we've used the fire halls, different fire stations. Uh, the last time I think we used uh, the middle school and we had medevac come in and land. But one thing we always do also is to keep that engagement going is we also do a kid print every single time we advertise that and it's always very successful. So always people always wanna bring their kids and get their fingerprints and have them on file. Um, 
a big thing that we do is increased interactions with youth. Uh, you see this more and more. I see a lot of social media, a lot of people tag their stuff doing this, uh, where we stop and play catch with the kids. Uh, a little quick game of basketball. You know, a lot of times this season, I've actually thrown out a bunch of first pitches at the Little League games. Anytime anybody sees a lemonade stand, I, you know, they always stop and buy the lemonade or buy the little waters, little bracelets. Actually, one of our guys even bought a pet rock. So ended up adopting that for the department here. Um, and again, just keep increasing interactions with the youth. One of my favorite engagement strategies is slow patrols, I call them. I have our guys try to drive around under nine miles an hour, try to hit nine miles an hour and stay at that speed. It's a pretty tough thing to do. I mean, we have smaller, smaller streets, so it's, but it's, everybody always wants to go 15 or 25, but it's I try to creep around at nine. But when you do that, uh, you really get a chance to make contact with people. You know, you see them sitting on their porch or they're walking on the street. And just because you're going slow, I always tell the guys, you know, make some kind of contact. You know, wave to them, say hello, and you'll be surprised. Every time you wave to somebody and say hello, they'll be like, hey, officer, and they'll stop you and you'll be able to talk again and get that community interaction going. I didn't get that. So one good thing is uh, strengthening the partnerships. So, again, since we've been working with, uh, you know, with the list brought us into this stuff here, the community area partnerships, uh, we get more personal with people. When we have our meetings and we where we go over what we're, the projects are going to be, we try to have an officer sit at a different table with somebody else and just really get to communicate with them. You know, get out of our comfort zones. You know, don't just stay with the police clicks sitting at this table and the partnership sitting at this table. We actually mix it up as much as we can. Uh, it really gets more personal and makes the programs work a lot better. Um, open other ideas. You know, we're so used to just arresting and the way we do things. It's nice to hear hey, maybe we should try to do this, you know, or get them help these other ways. Another thing is uh, finances for the greater good. How this works is instead of money for the police only, a lot of times cops, we always want to buy those gizmos and gadgets. You know, we think that's going to make it better. But instead of using it for that, we'll take that money and use it for the good of the public. Uh, again, putting it towards these art projects. Um, I think one time, I guess they bought planners for the downtown uh, rehabilitation areas, just like things like that, just, you know, putting the money into the community, not just for the police department's gizmos and gadgets. Coming around next is uh, crime assessments. Uh, the big thing is statistics. Uh, again, we were going over the statistics. Uh, statistics to help us understand and identify problems. Um, they basically, with data we gather, we can make predictions about the future. Statistics is like one of the main thing in the SARA model in the analysis space. Uh, again, we have to really need a focus down on them, and then uh, diligent enforcement. Anytime you have a target area, make sure you do the extra patrols, you know, always check it out, uh, into it a lot more. And uh, if you see any like minor problems, you know, don't just let it go. Don't little scoff laws, you know, address the issue and take care of it. So. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, the, our police have really bought into this. Um, and, and I think I just skipped over my slides a little bit too quickly. Let's see if I could go back. Here we go. Yeah, so that's how that's how we dropped our crime rate or our risk of crime from, you know, by 42% over, over a 10 year period. Uh, it was not easy. I think a lot of people in the community were actually surprised when we put this data out there because they knew all these activities were going on. Uh, but, you know, they don't, you know, they don't check the data every year. You know, and so when you look up after a 10 year period, it really makes a big difference. And it was really a part of the, our partnership that started, uh, that, that got us to apply for and, and receive the Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative funding. Because even though we've seen a, a, a tremendous reduction in our, in, in, our in, in, in our crime risk, we still see a high prevalence of particularly sexual violence and sexual assault. So now we're, we're working with our Tamaka Police and our Sexual Assault Resource Counseling Center uh, on specific targeted initiatives uh, to prevent and respond to, to sexual violence in our community. And so uh, hopefully we'll have some good data 10 years from now to talk about that too. So um, that, that's, uh, that's, what, that's what we've been doing in Tamaka for the last 10 years and, and with, with LISC help and, and the help from a lot of other people. So John, we're, we're happy to answer questions or talk through anything that we you know, might have uh, tickled somebody's mind as we went through what we've been doing. Absolutely. Thank you, Micah. Thank you, Chief. Really appreciate that kind of comprehensive overview of the work that you've done. And I think the, the points that stand out for me, just uh, top of mind, uh, before I put in the survey link and we take questions, 
um, just the, the fact that you've been at it for a number of years um, and that progress um, can be frustratingly slow at times. It can be uneven, but you kept at it. And I think that's really a, a, an important message for folks to hear. And just the number of entry points for partners or projects and initiatives. I think the comprehensive nature of what you're doing is, is just uh, fantastic. And combined with kind of Julianne's uh, overview of how Rural Lisk approaches their work, uh, hopefully um, uh, folks that are attending are, are finding this useful. Before we jump to questions, uh, as promised, I'm going to put their survey link now in the chat. Um, encourage folks to to click on that and open uh, that in a window now uh, and really appreciate um, the opportunity um, for, for you to fill out that that survey, um, because, again, we really appreciate your constructive critical feedback helps inform future content uh, and, and topics um, and, and helps us uh, improve the delivery of those those um, uh, RVCRI uh, events as well. I don't see any questions uh, in the chat at the moment. So the the first question that I think I'll I'll share is is for you, Micah, and for you, Chief Hobbs. And this was shortly after um, the June eighth um, knowledge sharing event um, that listed um, around the place in crime and septet or crime prevention through environmental design discussion. Uh, Micah, I believe you shared kind of an update um, that your team uh, had around a liquor license application in your safety corridor to talk through just a, a little bit about um, about that success story. Yeah, I think when, when you start working on, 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 a, on these things and talking, having these conversations about what are some of the factors that are contributing to, uh, to, to crime or make it more likely that crime is going to happen, and what are some things that reduce the risk of that crime, um, you know, the conversation starts to spill out. People don't, in, in, in some surprising places, uh, we had an application for a liquor license right in the middle of our downtown intersection in a historic building uh, where we're, we're probably not the most appropriate place for, for a liquor license. Um, in a in in a you know in a, in a storefront that was selling cigarettes and vapes and and had some gambling machines in it and uh, and during the hearing there to be a public hearing for a liquor license in Pennsylvania uh, during the public hearing uh, our our police chief you know was, was very quick to point out that hey look this is this is right in the middle of our safety initiative corridor and we've been investing a lot of time and energy and resources in there um, and you know this is a red dot it's not a green dot this is something that's uh, you know, that's going to make make crime more likely to happen and and, and make people feel less safe uh, in this area where people, a lot of a lot of investment is happening. Yeah, like Micah said, we going to that hearing. I know it's a must. You know, we, we just got rid of a bunch of problem area bars and which was the cause of alcohol. Now you're going to throw alcohol into a local smoke shop where they're just going to hang out at some tables, buy some booze, and you know sit on benches downtown while they're drinking. It, it just it was taking step backwards. You know, we don't want to go that direction. So we. Definitely had our opinion in that one. It turned out pretty positive, I believe. And I think that's such a a, a simple but such a really important, effective um, piece for for folks to remember that are, of course, maybe new to this work. To have a police chief testify or a police department uh, representative testify at a liquor license hearing is not kind of standard practice, right? Um, but that voice, that input, can be um, uh, really effective. Um, uh, when when they're going before uh, uh, elected officials or licensing boards. So Julianne, I'm going to pivot um, to you. Uh, would love for you to kind of expand upon um, uh, this point, particularly for folks that are kind of digesting your presentation, but again, they may be new to this work. So tell me or, or uh, uh, provide kind of the, the, the listeners advice that you would give to, to police departments that are interested in exploring um, community development partnerships locally, or that may be having running into challenges, kind of figuring out where to start, or if you've got a kind of a success story that you would want to highlight uh, in a way to answer that question. I mean, the success story was already shared. Like, <laughs> oh, and John, John, if I could just interrupt too, I think someone just chatted that the chat is disabled. Is that? They can ask questions in the Q&A, too. Oh, yeah, apologies for that confusion. Yep, uh, feel free to to put your comments or questions in the Q&A. Sorry about that. Uh, everybody running into some technical difficulties. What would it be if there wasn't some technical, technical difficulties? Keeps me on my toes, right? I mean, I think it's a miracle that I have not yet tried talking while I'm mute, even though it's been three years of Zoom life. Um, but I can't top the success story that we just heard. I mean, this this is like 
you know, we love talking about this 10 year commitment that we've had. Um, and, uh, but I will say my, I have a couple of pieces of advice just from working in rural for a while. <laughs> Um, in that, um, if there is, um, rural doesn't always have like an economic developer or a community, like a concentrated community developer. Um, and if there is their first thought is not to necessarily bring in someone to represent the law, the, the law enforcement agency that's in the community as part of the design of a, a community development or a project or any, any kind of other project, unless it's like very specifically, about uh, addressing a um, an access use or like, oh, we're gonna build a rehab center. Oh, we definitely need to include law enforcement. They don't often think to include law enforcement around discussions around housing or um, a placemaking set uh, event or um, unless it's like, oh, can the law enforcement come and be, you know, provide security? And it's like, that's very short-sighted um, because what I have found over and over again is if you include some a representative from law enforcement, whether that is the police or the fire chief or the, um, it's, it's usually a more robust project. Uh, my most recent examples are generally around the eclipse that's about to hit the most most of central uh, central U.S. Um, I've seen a lot of really amazing things started to come out, and these committees have included law enforcement from the very beginning to have conversations about. Um, and they, you know, conversations about access and transportation. And um, one of the communities I know is um, is a two lane highway. It's like this is how you get in and out of town. There's a huge logging company too. And the concept of bringing five thousand people, which is like they started, oh, we should have a huge festival, and to during the weekday because that's the day of the eclipse. And the law enforcement they brought in law enforcement from the very beginning. The chief of police for the community was like. <clears throat> Two lane highway, y'all, and we had logging trucks, and you haven't even talked to, you know, the the corporation that that runs this logging company, and it was like no one else in the room of thirty people had thought to even talk about transportation, the roads that their people were going to come in, and then additionally, the chief of police also talked about wastewater management, also started talking about. Uh, uh, permitting of people staying in campers. And so from the very beginning, they started addressing some of the logistics that only the chief of police had thought of. Everyone else was thinking very aspirationally how great it would bring be if they could bring in 5,000 people. And it wasn't like the chief of police didn't think aspirationally, but he was like, let's address some of the stuff that will break down from the beginning. And like, then we can start realistically. And it was it, honestly, that they are more prepared. I mean, this is still in April, and they are so prepared. They have reservations out the roof, and people in the community are very excited about it. Um, and honestly, I think the chief of police was a big part of it. The chief of police also happened to be the head of the board for the, um, they have a very small airplane strip, um, and they were able to reserve spaces at that. But again, no one else thought <laughs> this chief of police was like center of a lot of components without thinking of it. And they just happened to invite him because he knew somebody on the committee. Um, and it was, it's it's honestly, I've seen a lot of committees around the eclipse and this is the best one I've seen so far. Cause they, and I keep trying to tell them, call your chief, please call your fire chief. You know, make sure your, your highway department rep is there. <laughs> you are missing out if you're not including safety from the beginning. Um, and that happens a lot. I mean, when we're talking, I see housing developers, um, not include safety from the beginning. And so they're placing the huge developments in an area like uh, Micah talked about that has a high crime rate and has, you know, it's like inviting more challenges for an area, but because it was an open lot, they thought it was a great place to put it. Um, I will say for a department, I, you know, I would, I would start making yourself, you know, reaching out to the people, you know, are starting these projects. That's usually a chamber of commerce director, if you have an economic developer, um, if you have, you know, your mayor, like knowing that you are open to those conversations, they'll start inviting you. Um, I don't know if it's the first thought people have. And so they don't often think about it until it's too late. So that's my, my always advice is like making it very clear to the people in your community that are making these events. Um, you know, even if it's a sidewalk event, like Micah showed some great examples that I've seen in other communities that have not included law enforcement. And I've always thought that was a mistake. Um, there's, you know, why wouldn't you include law enforcement when you have these like sidewalk chalks or, um, you know, any kind of conversation about the future that doesn't include a safety component or a, a public safety component is just not thinking through the future. Um, so 
as a department, just making sure that everyone figuring out who's creating these things and making sure they know you are welcome. You want to come to those meetings, invite me. I'll come. If there's a sandwich or a pizza, I will also eat those. Um, but like, you know, they have to know you're available and interested. Um, and uh, it seems really simple, but it's, if you're not, you're their first thought, they don't often think about it, but um, and it seems like really simple advice, but honestly, it's the most effective. Thanks, Julian. Follow up question for for Micah and the chief. Um, now that you've seen this sustained um, work in in the safety quarter, what do you see as kind of the the what's next for the quarter? What are the kind of key next steps to to sustain that work? I mean, we still have we still have some things on our to do list in the corridor. There's still some some blighted properties, um, but we we've been focusing investment in that area. We're in the process of, uh, we just built, we, we just raised 1 point, or I'm sorry, $4.1 million. And we're building a new police station with a community center inside of the police station. So they'll be cohabitating with a, with a community center. Um, so we, we decided to put it in this AC area where, where our focus is. Uh, so that's happening there. Uh, we continue to do public art work um, projects there as well. Um, and we, we've also had quite a bit of, uh, you know, economic development, uh, um, you know, new businesses, new activities. Uh, we just had a new, a new, a new storefront open up, and she had a uh, a witches festival, like a little mini festival on Friday the thirteenth, uh, in our safety corridor. So really cute to see all these little children dressed as witches running around. Uh, what used to be a neighborhood where you know people felt unsafe. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of positive things happening. In, in the in the in, in the corridor, and uh, and and it really, it really it's really because we, the community has collectively you know put a lot of energy and effort there. So do see a question um, in the in the Q and A, um, Micah, Chief, and and Julianne, if you can uh, um, read that, I'll, I'll summarize. And this is from our, our our good friend Sergeant Burgess in in the Oneida, New York, um, uh, uh, Peer Grant site. Um, doing some some great work around um, uh, patrols of, of hotspot areas, um, really adept at using SEPTED uh, as a strategy to address some of the built environment challenges. But it sounds like they're having some challenges um, with um, uh, rental uh, apartments and absentee landlords. So looking for tips on kind of uh, engagement of those owners and engagements uh, of residents in those in those properties. So I, I open it up to to all three. I have some some thoughts of my own. It's kind of a key area of work I did pre LISC, um, but happy to turn to our, our our speakers first. I mean, one thing we did is we worked with our code enforcement and we really strengthened our ordinances on that. Uh, so with landlords and everything, we they have uh, inspections that they have to do that they have to put in. And uh, again, just uh, we always have to have somebody in contact. They have to have a, a manager that's accessible to that we have to be able to reach out if there's a problem or an issue with the, the problem or the apartments and stuff. So it's again, it's a good thing if you have a code enforcement to reach out to them and really hammer down on that a little bit more. Yeah, and so, some of our some of our most notorious landlords and property owners are live in Tamaqua. Uh, you know, they're you know, they're not necessarily after, there's no, there's nothing unique about n not living in the community. Uh, you know, some some people who own properties live locally and they they, they still have problem properties. Um, you know, using the arts has helped. You know, getting getting somebody to come out on a national night out or doing a community festival or something like that. Uh, you know, a lot of times the, the, the people in 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 in, in uh, rental rental units and things like that, they will come out uh, for those types of events. And um, and it, it, they, where they won't come out to Borough Hall or City Hall for a community meeting, uh, they might come for a, for a community event. And we just try to try to build a relationship with them. And then we also try to connect them to resources, um, yeah. you know, to, to fix up their property, to fix up their building, uh, to show that there's that it's worth investing in the building and not just speculating, not just buy a building and wait for town to fix up everything else and make your property worth more. Uh, it's worth putting some money into your building because you're going to get a return on it. And then, uh, and then we get, we often get, you know, get involved when the property comes up for sale. Uh, you know, we try to highlight the community and the neighborhood that it's in and the low crime rate now and, and everything else to try to make it, make it a very attractive place. Um, I will just add two things to this. Um, I often find that some of these um, these apartments, there's like one or two offenders that, that affect the entire larger community and they get, the whole community gets white, like lumped into the swath where it's, 
it's um it's it's which is an impact on you know like their willingness to care for the house the building because they're renting already but it's also like well no one treats us right anyway so um i will say like what we've done with absentee lawyer like absentee landlords and we see this a lot especially with um communities after disasters where people a speculator will come in and buy damaged properties and then rent them without the activities um is that um, a community-wide, like Micah mentioned, community-wide efforts to to beautify that space and to create programs based in that space, um, whether that is a be like a, an art project or like pickup nights or like the community members who are not part of the problem are part of the solution um, and figuring out what they want to make them invest in the, the spaces that are leaving, regardless of whether their landlord is involved. Um, and for the landlords, we have had mayors step in and if there is not a code or a policy already existing to do something that requires the absentee landlord to care for that space better. And in some cases, it almost encourages them to sell back local because they are not interested in like all the work that is done. Um, um, and we've seen some uh, from that. We've had a couple of examples of actual tenants uh, collaboratively buying the property together because the property ends up being very low cost at a certain point um, and we've come in and provided loans to upkeep the property um, to 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 rehab the building for the tenants that are living in even though they're low income um, collectively collaboratively they are able to buy the space and make it better so those are two things that we have you know <laughs> putting pressure like we the chief and Micah mentioned like putting pressure on the landlords almost to the point of like, let's encourage you not to be here. Um, right. And then also putting the solution in the hands of those who aren't the problem. Um, and they have a lot of power and they might not realize how much power they have to encourage the offenders to leave. Um, if, if they're making an awkward environment for the offenders, those they will leave. Um, and we've created space for those who want who need to be there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. I know we're we're running out of time. We're actually a couple of minutes over time. So Kanisha, we can go to the last slide, please. And this is just um, follow up resources. We encourage everyone to sign up for the Rural List uh, newsletter. You'll see Julianne's uh, contact information there. Uh, and then some Federal Reserve research Julianne wanted to make sure um, was made available to folks and we can have follow up conversations uh, with sites there. With that, want to be respectful uh, of everyone's time. Uh, I want uh, uh, attendees to join me in thanking uh, Micah, uh, Chief Hobbs, uh, and Julianne for their presentations, and want to thank all of the attendees for, for the great conversation and for, for the Q&A. Um, with that, uh, we stand adjourned. Uh, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone.